Hi, um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Helen Long and I'm a professor and the chair of SFU's Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies. I'm also the convener of this year's President's Dream Colloquium and I would like to welcome you all to our third public event, A Conversation with Dr. Thea Caccioni. Before we start the event, I would like to first acknowledge that I am privileged to be connecting in from my home in downtown Vancouver, which is on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I invite you to acknowledge and reflect on your relation to the land you're connecting from in the chat. Now, it's my honor to invite Elder Margaret George from the Swahaluk First Nation to share a blessing with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come and join with us during this time. And welcome to the territory of the First Nations people, the Musqueam, Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam. Just a quick prayer for you. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together today. Just guide each and every one of us on the path that we're on. Thanking our communities for allowing us to do the work that we do and our families for the time that we're not with them. I ask Great Spirit just to clear our paths, give us strength, and give us courage. I ask Great Spirit also to bless the little ones who are witnessing what we are doing and just keep our families safe, all my relations. I uh, want to thank Elder Margaret for her prayer and warm wishes. Um, this year's President Dream Closeness to Action, Creating from Social Justice Research, is made possible by generous funding from the President's Office, and also with the great support and collaboration of the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, SFU Public Square, and the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, which is celebrating 50 years of teaching social justice issue at SFU. Today's event is also co-sponsored by the Maggie Benston Lecture Series in honor of the late Dr. Margaret Lowe Benston, um, who is a charter faculty member of SFU and whose distinguished academic career spanned the fields of chemistry, computing science, and women's studies. She was a co-founder of the Women's Studies Program and the Society for Canadian Women in Science and Technology. The lecture series was established in her name by her family, friends, and colleagues to commemorate her achievements and to continue her work on social justice issues. And this connects wonderfully with the topic of this year's President's Dream Colloquium. So it's my pleasure to invite our president, Dr. Joy Johnson, to say a few words about the Dream Colloquium. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, and I wanna thank Elder Margaret as well for starting us off in a good way. Uh, I am really privileged to be speaking to you today on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. It's a beautiful day here in Vancouver. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here for the President's Dream Colloquium. This is an event that uh, really is a highlight of my day. Um, and uh, as Helen's mentioned, the theme of the Dream Colloquium is from conversations to action, creating from social justice research. And I'm really excited about today's event, a conversation with the uh, Caccioni. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us online today. And um, this is, uh, if this is the first time that uh, the, that the colloquium, this is the first time the colloquium has been um, offered online. And the format I think is working really well. I'm really pleased that all of you um, could join us. Um, I have to say um, that this dream colloquium um, um, was not my initial idea. It was launched in 2012 and to create a forum for interdisciplinary engagement ac across our SFU students, faculty, staff, as well as the broader communities that we serve at SFU. And they really focus on themes that are of interest um, to the university and beyond. The colloquium includes a combination of public events uh, and student seminars, and this series is slightly different um, from what it has been in the past, partly because it's virtual, but also because of a more interactive conversational format that's being used. 
Students um, in the colloquium are learning from leading social justice advocates um, about how they've made an impact. And these students are also um, being helped to develop their own creative ways to move from conversation to action. This semester, there are 18 students from diverse disciplines, including gender, sexuality, and women's studies, resource and environmental management, contemporary arts, education, and urban studies, uh, who are enrolled for credit in the colloquium. And they'll have opportunities to learn not only from faculty members and guest speakers, but also from each other. By promoting interdisciplinarity, um, evidence-based dialogue on important topics, the Dream Colloquium reflects SFU's vision to be Canada's engaged university while providing rewarding, inspiring, and, and interdisciplinary student experiences. So we're really delighted to present today's conversation with very special guest, Thea Caccioni, who's an associate professor in the Department of Gender Studies at the University of Victoria. Dr. Caccioni's work examines the medicalization of sex, gender, and sexuality. Broadway, broadly, as well as through specific diagnoses such as female sexual dysfunction and polycystic ovarian syndrome. A previous SFU, Ruth Wynn Woodward Endowed Chair, we are really excited to welcome her back to SFU. Uh, this colloquium series also celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at SFU. It just seems amazing that we've had uh, you know, to think about 50 years um, uh, of, of advocacy and social justice work. Uh, it's been 50 years since SFU offered the first course in women's studies, and that course was entitled The Geography of Gender. So I really want to recognize that we stand on the shoulders of many, many scholars who have built GSWS into what it is today, a groundbreaking, cutting edge and interdisciplinary department. So congratulations to all of you on this milestone. I wanna thank the faculty and staff members who've conceived of this colloquium and who've worked so hard to make it possible. I wanna thank our colloquium partners, Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, SFU Public Square. Um, I wanna also thank um, Steve Benish and Stacey Makertoff from, from the Graduate Studies Office. And I also want to thank the Dean and Associate Provost Jeff Dirksen and Associate Dean Roxanne Panchazzi for helping organize the 14th President's Dream Colloquium. You're going to have an opportunity to share your ideas and questions during the conversation, and I encourage you to do so. So with that, I'm going to hand the, back, the floor back to you, Helen, and I really look forward to this program. Uh, thank you so much, Joy. Um, so before I introduce Dr. Caccioni, I would like to first give you a brief rundown of our event and also remind you of our community guidelines. Um, we will first begin with Dr. Caccioni's presentation. And after that, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function. A student from our colloquium, Dasha Jadav, who's completing a master's degree in public health at the Faculty of Health Sciences will be our moderator. She's working with a team of our other colloquium students behind the scenes, and they will remind you of the details uh, at the start of the Q&A and also on the chat. You are very welcome and encouraged to use the chat function throughout the event, but please observe our community guidelines and be respectful citizens. Now, closed captioning is also available if you click on the CC button at the bottom. Finally, there will be a draw for prizes that are generously provided by SFU's alumni office before we finish. So do stay to the end to see if you get lucky. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Thea Caccioni back to SFU, where she held the Ruth Wynne Woodward Junior Chair in Women's Studies from 2010 to 2011. She is currently an Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Gender Studies at the University of Victoria. Uh, as President Joy Johnson has mentioned, her research really examines how science, medicine, and the pharmaceutical industry shape our understanding of sex, gender, and sexuality. She has published many influential articles and is the author of the book, Big Pharma, Women, and the Labor of Love, published by the University of Toronto Press. Now, the highly recognized research in this book led her to twice testify at the US Federal Drug Administration against an ineffective drug with harmful side effects, hyped in the media as a pink Viagra. Her current research is focused on an examination of the polycystic ovarian syndrome diagnosis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thea Caccioni.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And for everyone who put so much work into organizing this, I really appreciate it. Thank you um, to everyone attending as well. I'm seeing lots of familiar faces or names, I should say. Okay, so I want to acknowledge with respect that I live and work on unceded Lekwungen territory and the Wasainich, Songhees and, and um, Esquimalt people continue to have a relationship with this land to this day. I'm going to share my slides and hopefully that works. Did that work? Yeah, there they are. Can you see them? Yeah. I'll put it on slideshow. Okay. Okay, so the title of my talk, as you see here, is Becoming a Scholar Activist. And the focus is this transition I made from being primarily an academic, um, you know, disseminating my work through writing a book, journal articles, conference papers, teaching, to what I'm terming here a scholar activist activist, someone who uses their research skills and knowledge outside of the university and other academic circles for the purpose of social change, and it can be small or large in scope. So I'm going to tell you about my research for the first half of the talk, and then I'll get into my scholar activism, um, because the former really grounds the latter. My research is broadly focused on scientific and medical discourses on health and the body as they relate to sex, gender, race, class, and sexuality, historically and in contemporary times. In my teaching as well, inspired by authors like these, we look at how medical diagnoses like nymphomania, frigidity, and psychiatry's use of the term homosexuality to signify illness for so many years have attempted to maintain the really reproductive focus of sex. We note that the label of paraphilia, a term kind of used for sexual deviances, um, collapses consensual BDSM with non-consensual sexualized violence. And we also question why doctors demand uh, the surgical alteration um, of intersex infants, non-consenting, of course, um, at birth, despite evidence of its harm, while maintaining really strict medical gatekeeping around adult uh, trans surgeries. We question the ways in which scientific and medical discourse has worked towards constructing categories of racial difference in an effort to justify the dehumanization of slavery and colonization and the role importantly that this played in practices like forced sterilization and other forms of genocide which we will see to this day so my research on medical discourse as it relates to identity began with my ma dissertation which traced expert discourses on female promiscuity from the late 19th century to the present and i noted that doctors psychoanalysts popular psychologists many experts stigmatized active non-monogamy in women and not men I also conducted interviews with regular lay people and noted that female promiscuity is sometimes celebrated, is sometimes still highly stigmatized. As well, it is pathologized through seemingly compassionate psychologizing language, such as uh, she must be in need of a father figure or she really craves a lot of male attention or maybe she has been sexually abused. So there's that kind of trickle down of expert discourse, in this case, really Freudian terminology into lay everyday vernacular. And I noticed how race and class privilege and lack thereof plays a role in how overt or subtle the stigma she faces is. When I started to think about what to write about for my PhD thesis um, in the early 2000s, Viagra had just been marketed to blockbuster success, meaning over a billion dollars profit in one year. 
And there was almost immediate speculation of the potential market for a so-called pink Viagra, this really problematic and gendered term the press was using from the very beginning. So I decided to focus my efforts examining the politics surrounding the medicalization of women's sexual problems. And I did so mainly in three concentrated areas. First, I traced the construction of the newly created diagnosis of female sexual dysfunction, the label that doctors and scientists were hired by drug companies to create while searching for a sex drug aimed at women. Just like the makers of Viagra replaced the diagnosis of impotence, remember that word, with erectile dysfunction to negate any kind of psychological or social connotations and to make drug treatment more obvious, these experts agreed that the now outdated term frigidity would not appeal to a wide audience of women and also would not lend itself really to drug treatment. Therefore, they came up with this seemingly neutral, very scientific kind of term, female sexual dysfunction, FSD in shorthand, and gave it four subsets related to desire, arousal, orgasm, and sexual pain. In contrast with erectile dysfunction, of course, which is focused solely on arousal. So you have this reinforcement of the sex gender binary, as you see on this model here, that suggests that women are very complicated sexually, whereas for men, it's just about the flick of a switch. And of course, there's no kind of framework for any non-binary identity there. Second, I examined the ways in which discourses on FSD shifted every, with every drug hopeful. So the first attempt was to hijack the Viagra model and look for a vascular drug that increased blood flow to the genitals. Viagra didn't work. Ironically, the only vascular treatment um, approved by the FDA in that period was the Eros clitoral therapy device you see here on the top left. It's a very expensive, we're talking like 400 US dollars, uh, prescription only sex toy, carefully constructed in medical terms as effective with regular use, of course, before intercourse, which remains the main event in this paradigm. And very kind of doom and gloom discussion around it in contrast to the really happy, playful Viagra ads we were seeing. So in 2000, researchers switched gears entirely and began to consider the possibility that sexual difficulties in women should be treated as hormonal problems. Not surprisingly, this was the same year that Procter & Gamble had developed a testosterone patch called Intrinza. It was denied approval by the FDA in 2006 due to some pretty important safety concerns as well as total lack of efficacy. So this last um, image you see on the bottom here, the, in, the industry shifted gears once again to consider FSD as a matter of neuroscience, just as a drug called phlebanserin in its pre-branded state became the next drug to go up for FDA approval. And I'll tell you about the details of phlebanserin later because it's this ineffective and potentially dangerous drug that my scholar activism has been primarily dedicated to so far. But just as this last scholarly point I'll discuss, I was really disturbed by the fact that the debates around FSD were dominated by this kind of vast polemic on the one side, drug companies, and on the other side, feminist critics like myself. And we were not hearing from women who identify as having sexual problems there. There was no kind of public voice. So I also interviewed lay women, and these discourses feature really prominently in the book I published in 2015. The women in my study did not locate their sexual problems in their bodies, um, save for some iatrogenic concerns around antidepressants or perhaps, um, you know, some injuries related to childbirth. They located their sexual problems in their relationships with, for the most part, men 
and in their relationships with the broader culture, which among many other things, number one, told them you're only sexy if you meet and conform to beauty standards, celebrated beauty standards that typically involve being thin and often white, and two, expected them to be highly sexual, yet, as I mentioned, that sexual double standard is still lingering. Three, they lamented their sexual socialization offered a narrow kind of sexual script and really little education on female sexual pleasure. So the labor of love, as I refer to here in the book title, reflects this sense that many had accepted that the men in their lives and the broader culture were not going to change. Um, so they felt it was up to them to work on their mental and uh, physiological response to meet what was considered normal. And that was very striking, especially in, in the sample of women who had sexual pain issues. And you can ask me about that later. So all of this that I've described so far really angered me. And um, my scholar activism uh, started with me finding a very interdisciplinary group of academics, health professionals, artists, activists, sex educators, who were challenging the sexual pharmaceutical industry under the banner of a new view of women's sexual problems, the New View campaign for short. And we were led by Dr. Leonore Tiefer, a prolific biologist turned sex therapist turned activist. But we also really formed some really important um, coalitions with the US National Women's Health Network, Our Bodies Ourselves, and farmed out a Georgetown led, uh, Georgetown network led by Dr. Adrian Fugue Berman. I feel it's really important to mention here that none of these groups are anti-drug and we all believe in the importance of pharmaceuticals when they have an adequate risk to benefit ratio. I'm basically saying we're not anti-vax um, and I feel it's important to mention that in the midst of a global pandemic. For one, vaccines are held to a far more stringent standard than other drugs. But we were really concerned that health research was more focused on the sector of making well people better. And that it was, than it was on addressing key socioeconomic and political determinants of health and affordable access to life-saving medications. As well, and this is key, we all believed that sex is more like dancing than digestion as a, a, qu a quote by, by Leonor Tiefer. And I think this is key. Um, it seemed to us that the medical approach to thinking about sexual desire was very limited. So in the years that followed the completion of my PhD in 2007, social media was in its infancy, but we used a very low tech political organizing tool, the email listserv, if you remember those, to share information. But it was in large part, to be honest, something as simple as creating a Google alert for terms like female sexual dysfunction that really kept many of us on the cutting edge of what was unfolding in the pharma funded scientific arena. And I really recommend you do this if you're very invested in a particular issue. Many of us conducted educational workshops in our own communities and contributed to this resource website you see here on the left. We also made our presence known at medical conferences um, where we, when we were allowed in. Sometimes we were actively banned for not having an industry connection. And eventually we learned that the German drug company Boehringer Ingelheim was bringing phlebanserin to the US Federal Drug Administration. This is um, a little storyboard about the New View campaign that ended in 2016. We were um, invited to have our work archived at the Kinsey Institute in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. So um, phlebanserin, I promised you I would tell you more. There was, this was a failed antidepressant drug that according to its makers improved, unexpectedly improved sexual desire in women. However, in reality, in clinical trials with thousands of women in North America and Europe, this daily use drug added only one 
or sorry, only 0.7 sexually satisfying events, SSEs, per month. So you take a day, a, a drug every day, unlike Viagra, and you don't even have a full sexually satisfying event per month, which by their definition included sexual fantasies. Plus 14% of clinical trial participants dropped out due to side effects that included fainting, nausea, and dizziness. The alcohol safety data on this drug was only offered when the FDA demanded it, and the data was suspiciously based on a sample of only 25 people, 22 of whom were male. So obvious, huge red flag there. What are they hiding with this alcohol issue? So we scoured the FDA website for how we could participate in its hearing to challenge this drug that it clearly had such a dismal risk to benefit ratio. We actually weren't invited as experts through any grand invitation. We figured out that the US, in the US, a drug, the drug approval hearing allows for public input and we decided to make our input heard. And by the way, that, that is not a possibility in Canada, unfortunately. So to counter the PR circus around phlebanserin, which was already being hyped in the media as a life-changing kind of drug and with press releases from the drug company, we drummed up intense scrutiny of the drug in the media. We wrote our own press releases and we were featured in every major newspaper really in North America and many beyond. In planning for this hearing, we submitted an annotated bibliography of interdisciplinary research that highlighted the psychological, interpersonal, and political factors that shape sexual desire to their online docket. Um, something else we kind of learned about ourselves. So this research um, countered the strict physiological basis of low desire that drug companies were arguing for with the backing of really vague and junk science. I really wanna stress that. Um, we drummed up numerous letters from well-known doctors who agreed with our concerns. So in terms of testimony on the day of the hearing, some focused on flaws in the methodology of the clinical trials including inconsistencies in survey instruments and the endpoints they strived for, and others highlighted the strength of the, of the placebo effect, which was strikingly good. In my testimony, I argued there's no empirical evidence to support a baseline level of normal uh, desire or even a method for quantifying one. Also, norms of desire vary from era to era and culture to culture. I pointed out that even the most medicalizing of sources, the American Psychiatric Association, had moved to strike the desire component from their classification of FSD. This caused a lot of confused looks and paper shuffling among the panel, um, which was quite exciting because you can't approve a drug unless there is a legitimate diagnostic category for it to treat. So we also disrupted this really institutional space in various ways. Um, director Liz Kanner played her documentary film Orgasm Inc. on a continuous loop in the room next door. She was able to rent a meeting room and it's an expose on the inner workings of the sexual pharma industry. So she paid for a room with her own funds in hopes that panel members would catch bits and pieces of it on their break. And we also held up a petition in a dramatic kind of way, a long banner of paper spanning the back of the room. Flabanserin was denied approval that day and we really thought we had done a great job. It was soon after sold to a small company called Sprout Pharmaceuticals who tried to resubmit it to the FDA and they said no. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. An organization called ISWISH, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, a heavily phar pharma funded group of doctors who um, all have links with specific drug companies that have a vested interest here. 
um, launched the Even the Score campaign. Taking the FDA to task for not approving phlebanserin, even the score claims that 26 sex drugs have been approved for men's sexual dysfunction. This statistic is completely false. A more accurate number would be three. They were nonetheless able to convince some Congresswomen and several legitimate women's health organizations who were not aware of the facts. We call this astroturfing when a corporation uses the language and images of grassroots kind of social movements to sell their products or to have a product approved or deregulated. Most likely as a response to the public, there was a lot of media scrutiny now um, of even the score. The FDA announced a series of patient-centered meetings for diseases with unmet drug needs in 2014, and they included FSD alongside diagnoses like HIV, sickle cell disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's, etc. And we found out that ISWISH members were offering to pay the patients, sorry, ISWISH was offering to pay the patients of ISWISH members to attend. Money is from multiple sources, they said. Meanwhile, the ethical doctors and therapists on our side would never dream of recruiting their patients to the circus. And so we went back to the FDA. When we returned to DC, this time to the bigger FDA headquarters, we were pretty shocked to see busloads, literally busloads of women, all white and seemingly in about their 30s, wearing turquoise silk scarves, holding even the score goodie bags and wearing buttons that said hashtag women deserve. We learned that they had been put up at the same hotel and coached at a pre-hearing breakfast. Their testimonies were strikingly homogenous. They said, I feel like my body has betrayed me. We have no relationship problems, but in the same breath, they said, we have regular duty sex or obligatory sex. I consider it a success when he gets off, but I still feel guilty. I know I'm dysfunctional because I don't have desire 24 seven. So all really locating dysfunction in their bodies and claiming no relationship problems, but talking about regular duty or obligatory sex. We had only two members, um, so-called patients with us, people who identified as having sexual dysfunction and they had much more complex, messy stories to tell. And by the way, this was the audience, basically men in suits. So we pled the line between patient perspectives and industry is clearly very thin. We can't even the score without an ineffective, let alone safe drug. And we reminded them that in the first year of Viagra, 550 Viagra users died later leading to warning labels about contraindications of Viagra with certain heart conditions due to a rushed approval process. But I could feel we were starting to lose momentum. I still told myself it is important for there to be a counter voice on the record. Unfortunately, and I'm wrapping up here, I will end by telling you there was one last very pivotal hearing in 2015, and that is when the drug was approved, albeit with a very strict risk mitigation strategy due to safety concerns. I attended via live web stream. The FDA panel were blunt that they had serious concerns about this drug. The next day, the drug was sold for $1 billion to a larger drug company. With that said, the drug was, has so far been a total flop. I'm sure it's high price point played a role. However, I like to think that we played a role through education, media engagement, testimony, and changing the public conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Thea, and for sharing that long journey that you've been on. 
Um, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, quickly introduce myself. I'm Daksha. I'm a Master of Public Health student in the Faculty of Health Sciences and one of the students in the Dream Colloquium this semester. And as your moderator for the rest of the hour, I will begin with some questions from the class and then move on to some questions from the audience. So uh, to begin, I'll just start with some questions from the class. Our first question um, considers the medicalization around sexual functioning. And one of the questions we had for you was, who does, and in your view, who should determine what sexual performance or dysfunction is and what merits medical attention? That's a great question, yes. So I'm not denying that there are not um, physiological, you know, aspects to sexual functioning, if you want, if we want to use that term. Um, some of the big ones, like I said, are iatrogenic um, side effects of drugs and um, antidepressants are, are a major category there. Um, also, there are issues around childbirth and breastfeeding as well. Um, breastfeeding can lead to um, low estrogen levels and the thinning of vaginal tissue and um, there's a kind of cascade effect. But I think that we have, you know, at least a solid 50 years of feminist research behind us and all sorts of research really to show us that sex takes place in a very interpersonal and social context and a political one as well. And so the interviews, um, that I did, you know, it was the physiological aspect was sometimes um, a factor and, and for sure with the women with chronic sexual pain, which I didn't really get into, but it, it's, a, it's a legitimate kind of physiological issue. But their distress was not really so much around the pain often as the social sanctions and stigma they faced as a result of being unable to engage in this kind of hallowed act of penetrative sex. Um, so when they would seek treatment, they would um, be given like graduated vaginal dilators to work on being able to achieve penetration rather often than um, being schooled on what could um, be pleasurable for them outside of penetrative sex and just going with what feels good. So. I think there is a role for sexual medicine and for GPs being, um, you know, really attuned to sexual issues that could have a physiological basis. But I think it's um, more often than not relates to the imperson interpersonal, social and political world of sex. And even when issues are more physiological, I think we have to really think about the way that norms are constructed and, you know, the sense of kind of isolation you can feel when you don't meet those norms. I hope that answered it. Definitely, I think there's a world of, a, of, of discussion that can happen just from that question itself. Yes. Um, one of the things that your work did was center the voices of the women and the people involved in, um, in this particular process. And one question that we had for you was, how was your experience of accessing biomedical spaces as a gender and sexuality studies researcher? Oh, great question. Um, I had to go through so many institutional uh, loopholes to just to have a sign up at the sexual medicine clinic in Vancouver. And um, I wanted to be able to interview patients. And that would be totally voluntary on their part. Um, I would, you know, they would just send a mail out of my study and patients could contact me. But in order to do that, I actually had to do mock interviews in front of a panel of doctors who were watching me through, what is that called? Uh, Two-way mirror, or whatever. I can't kind of remember that title. Um, I literally had to be like examined doing these interviews um, to, ma to make sure that, um, that I wasn't going to say anything that they didn't approve of. And I understand um, doctors wanting to protect patients, absolutely. But then it, on the other hand, you know, med students have a lot of access to patients. Um, I was a grad student from a different discipline. So it's kind of interesting that gatekeeping there. 
definitely. And I know that you elaborated this on this in your book as well. Mm -hmm. if, uh, some of our audience would like to explore that in your writing. Um, another question that we had for you was, as an academic and as an activist, um, do you have any advice for students and new academics to bridge those two areas? Um, sorry, can you say that one more time? Of course. So as an academic and as an activist, do you have any advice for students and newer academics yes. to bridge those two areas? Yes, I'm glad you asked that. I mean, I think right now we are in the midst of so many vibrant, important social justice movements. And I know that you students are already really actively engaged with them and they're hugely important. And you can be an activist. You don't have to be a scholar activist exactly who's doing this. But I think that, um, yeah, I really encourage my students to think about their um, training in critical thinking and analysis and understanding structural power relations. Um, all of these things as tools that could be brought into, you know, real world settings, not just for, for research essays. There's some... I think there's also a really kind of practical, boring answer to this, which is it's thinking outside of the box and kind of dreaming big in what you're approaching. You know, we we were really just surfing the web and looking at the FDA website and creating Google alerts and doing these really kind of simple things that led to a really big moment for us. Um, and I think we've, unfortunately, in the academic world, we've come to kind of a stifling place where we think we need a big research grant to be able to, to act on anything, to do anything. Um, and I really encourage people to think about, no, you can just actually um, pursue these areas of social justice and um, find out what you can do to help where, where some, where you have a skill that might be needed. So really just kind of thinking in practical terms, I think is important. And also that coalition building part, because as soon as we partnered with DC based groups, like the National Women's Health Network and the Georgetown group farmed out, you know, we were able to learn so much more through these other groups. So sometimes I think social justice groups um, fall into the pitfall of, you know, um, almost like competition, whereas, you know, building coalition is always the most powerful. Definitely, I think there's some wise words in there for us, our new academics and scholars in the room. Um, going back to your research on FSD, in your PCOS and other research, have you found a divergence in queer and non-queer experiences of FSD? Yes, so glad you asked. Um, I didn't really talk about that. So in my book, I noticed that um, there was only, so there was only, there was a very small sample of queer identified people in, in my interviews. But what was interesting was they would they would say things like, well, being queer, you know, I, I'm not the sort of, you know, head in the sort of heterosexual bind of all these norms and narrow kind of views of sexuality. Um, but they also expressed that they weren't out entirely outside of the hegemony of heteronormativity, if you will. So, you know, they still felt the media messages, they still felt um, that kind of sexual and gender messaging, and it still stung when they faced stigma. So on the, on, at the same time though, I think whether queer or heterosexual, some people um, in the study just gave up on the sexual norms and said, I'm gonna go with what feels good. And those were the people that um, seemed the happiest and were the most upbeat, or they said, I'm getting a divorce. I'm taking a break from sexual relationships. I'm finding a new partner, you know, really simple things like that. Um, and then it was so interesting to move into an entirely new topic of research, this research I'm doing on polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I'm finding a similar trend where, um, a lot of the distress over PCOS is about this kind of sense of failure at heterosexuality, failure at femininity, 
um, failure because PCOS symptoms involve things like uh, facial hair, a high body mass index, um, acne, infertility. They don't always involve that, but they can. So there's that sense. But then on the other hand, a lot of the participants I've interviewed so far have said things like, um, you know, having these symptoms, having these traits has kind of forced me to work through some of the stigma and some of these social norms. Um, and I've kind of, uh, you know, either connected to queer community or not, but through various means um, come to a more body positive um, or fat activism kind of place or, you know, various stories where they were kind of challenging these hegemonic norms and coming out a lot happier, it seemed, often. Sorry, that is so interesting to hear about and learn about. Um, I will take a small turn to audience questions now and I'll encourage your audience to submit any questions they have for Thea using the Q&A function. Um, our first question is, is HRT a type of desire control or manipulation? And is it a new in interest in its use, uh, a way of dealing with desire? And how is this just another way to make women always ready? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one thing about HRT, um, hormone replacement therapy is it's aimed at, you know, often menopausal women and um, if you think about this whole industry, it's aimed often at kind of an aging population. Like we talk about how the boomers, you know, started the first sexual revolution. And so much of that was facilitated through the birth control pill, which is a hormone based drug. And now these aging boomers are looking for pharmaceutical um, solutions. And I think what gets lost in that is just, um, embracing you know various life stages but i'm not opposed to the concept i think that always with hormone therapies you know there are there are concerns around the risk to benefit ratio and i'm not saying that um the benefit you know in certain cases can be enough um where you would choose that kind of path but yeah, I agree that if you think about the way that HRT was introduced to the culture in the 1960s, Dr. Robert Wilson published a book called Feminine Forever and basically told women, if you don't take hormone therapy, you know, as you approach menopause, you're going to be decrepit, you're going to lose your sexuality and your femininity. And that really began the intense medicalization of menopause that we've seen since it was kind of the last aspect of the female reproductive system to be heavily menopo uh, menopause medicalized. And moving on to another audience question. Uh, you spoke of the role of marketing for ED and FSD pharmaceuticals. What is your sense of the role and effects of marketing of herbs for female and male sex sexual satisfaction? Yeah, I have to say, like, I've always been a more naturopathic person and kind of, I think I was kind of naive to how much um, the supplement industry is mimicking the pharma industry in so many aspects of their marketing. Um, and so I think supplements are something that are, less, you know, they're not regulated. Um, in some ways, they can, you know, I, in some ways, pharma is trying to suppress them because you know they want to like you know make a patent around vitamin c for example and have a drug company own it which doesn't seem right um but on the other hand we have to be careful because there's really sophisticated marketing techniques being used in the world of supplements lots of junk science lots of um lots of really seductive marketing and there's so many people who are fed up with regular medicine um, and not getting help that, you know, they're more likely to turn to this area, which can be really expensive. Um, so I think in the one, I have a very mixed view where on the one hand, I would say that these can be this kind of um, counter option. And on the other hand, um, we have to kind of think carefully about each one individually. I think what's missing from this conversation too, is just 
like what will the role of marijuana be in this right um certain strains of weed are you know sexual enhancing and um nobody's talking about that so um as 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 cannabis becomes um you know more regulated you know is is the pharma industry going to kind of swoop in on that in relation to this kind of sexual issue definitely and um another q a question that we have is um are there cultures that view female promiscuity in a less negative or more positive light than here in the west yes um kim talber um is an Indigenous scholar in Canada who has been writing about um, this very issue, how, um, you know, not all Indigenous cultures, but many um, really had a more kind of um, open attitude towards um, female promiscuity. And I think that everyone did pre-capitalism pre the sexual division of labor that depended so much on this kind of these reproductive roles and you know these gender roles of reproduction in the home and and um, paid labor outside of the home so I think that for sure cross culturally we can look to examples. One thing I should say about that MA research um, is that was kind of pre dating app as well I think there's been more of a resurgence of the kind of normalization of hooking up and and having um you know promiscuous sex and and not it, it not being such a big deal but i do still think there is that gendered kind of good girl um pressure that continues to exist and that subtle psychologizing i was talking about definitely and i will just take a quick look at our q a section and see if we have any more questions coming in for you These are great questions, by the way. Thank you so much. I was wondering what you would ask. <laughs> I think we've got a very engaged audience here with us today. That's great. And just a reminder to anyone in the audience who would like to get a last minute question in, you can use the Q&A function to submit a question. I'm trying to think if there was something that I had to take out of the talk that I wanted to talk about. Well, if, um, if it doesn't come to mind right away, the one question we do have for you is, uh, what's exciting about your current research? And what would you like to share with us about what you're currently up to? Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, I have to say, I thought I was moving on to an entirely new area of research. Um, PCOS has a lot of striking similarities with research on intersex, where we're talking about biological sex. We're talking about the fact that there is more variation in biological sex than um, is often kind of widely understood. On the other hand, PCOS um, might be really, or is really also affected by endocrine disruptors in the environment. So um, there's this kind of whole environmental area that I haven't really gone to yet, but I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but I have to say, I thought that I would just be, you know, writing this new book and moving on. I think I will be dragged back into my other research because um, more drugs are being approved. And I forgot to mention that Addy, which Phlebanserin was branded as, was approved by Health Canada soon after in the U.S. So I think, I think we haven't heard the end of it. I think they will figure out a way to market it more successfully than they have. Um, and there's another drug that was just approved called Vilesi, so. Lots of future directions. Um, yes. That's all we have, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, um, I think in my teaching, the issues around the politics of race as related to the history of medicine and contemporary medicine, there's a class action suit um, of indigenous women in Canada suing doctors for ongoing forced and coerced sterilization. So that's an area that I'm really passionate about as well. Definitely. And 
um, I think that's all for our time this afternoon. And I want to thank you so very much for answering all of the wonderful questions posed by your audience as well as from the class and for your incredible presentation. It has been such a joy to speak with you today. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, friends, for joining. I'm seeing so um, many names. Hi. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Thea, so much. Um, and I, I'm glad you're also seeing friends in the audience. Um, I just want to let everybody know that um, before we conclude, there is a price draw. So, so just don't lock off just yet. And I al also want to um, invite all of you to join us for the final colloquium event. Um, and you can see the details on the screen. Um, thank you, Thea, for such a generous conversation. And I hope in the future, we can welcome you back in person. Yeah. Um, and so the two prize winners that I want to announce, um, the first prize is a $100 SFU Bookstore prize pack, and it goes to Mario Olanga. The second prize is a DoorDash e-voucher or a SFU swag prize worth $50, and it goes to Tara Shustarian. And you will be hearing from SFU alumni office who will email you about how to uh, pick up your prizes. So congratulations. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I hope to see many of you again soon. And uh, meanwhile, take care and have a good afternoon.